welcome back. Um, sorry. <laughs> it's been a day. It's 2 p.m. Welcome back to the Ghost River Triangle Convention. Um, I'm Bernie, and with me here today is the Pur Purgatory Archaeological Survey. Um, joining us once again uh, to finish up the incredible presentation about the historical context of the OK Corral. Thank you so much for coming back. Um, yeah. I'm thanks for having me. Thanks for thanks for doing the part two. I'm so excited. I'm so glad we could do this. M me too. Uh, I was so sad that we had to cut it short last time. Um, but should we just jump right in? Yeah, let's just jump right in. So, so uh, again, I would like to start out this panel with uh, with a, uh, to acknowledge the various indigenous people groups affiliated with the lands that we'll be discussing today. So I am still presenting in Omaha, Nebraska, the ancestral lands of the Omaha, Oto, and Osheti Shakowin, uh, our beloved Ghost River, River Triangle, which panel is named after, um, is situated in the, the traditional territories of the First Nations of the Treaty 7 region in Southern Alberta. And the subject of our panel today in Tombstone, Arizona is home to a number of Apache tribes, but um, particularly situated in the traditional territories of the Chiricahua Apache. Um, we acknowledge these traditional caregivers of these lands and the importance of commitment and continued self-education, awareness, and actions toward decolonization for the dignity and equality of all. Uh, in this presentation, I have still kept those three QR codes. Uh, one is to the Treaty 7 uh, First Nations Chief Association website, and the other one is for the Chiricahua Apache Tribes website. Uh, for you to check out at your leisure uh, to learn more about these indigenous sovereign nations and at the bottom there's also a qr code that will take you to the website that has consolidated testimonies of for the prosecution and defense of the hearing immediately preceding the ok corral shootout um, including testimony from from wyatt and ike and others and is a pretty pretty cool resource so i encourage you guys to check that out too so i figured we could go ahead and start with uh, kind of setting the scene again, who are we talking about? Where are we talking about? We could do a little short review of the shootout itself briefly before we jump in where we left off last time. Cool. Sounds great to me. Um, so let's jump in with the who, when, and where, right? Yeah, who, when, and where. So we are still talking about the OK Corral shootout. Um, we are talking about the Earps and Holiday. Um, and we are talking about the Cowboys. Again, the Cowboys refers to um, Ike Clanton, Billy Clanton, uh, Billy Claiborne, Tom McClory, and Flank Frank McClory in this, in this scenario. These are the main players involved in the shootout. The OK Corral is located in Tombstone, Arizona, which is in the southeast corner there of Arizona. And this took place, the actual event took place in, uh, Octo on October 26th, 1881. So now we got that out of the way, uh, let's jump to the day of the shootout. Sorry if you guys can hear my cat, by the way. She has, she's not a fan of the Cowboys. Anytime I mention them, like she just goes berserk. So <laughs> like who can blame her, right? Um, so the, okay, so the OK Corral, like we, like we covered before, the event itself actually only took 30 seconds. We have a lot of buildup, both personal, political, cat, personal, political, and otherwise sort of uh, heightening the tension leading up to this event. Um, you had death threats, mostly coming from Mike Clanton, leading up to immediately before that, specifically toward uh, Holiday, but also toward the Earps themselves. And you had a couple of the cowboys unarmed during this event. Uh, the two unarmed cowboys, I believe, were unharmed during the shootout, but three of the cowboys did end up dying uh, as a result of the shootout. Um, and you had Virgil, who is the actual lawman. He is the, the elected official in this situation, the U.S. Marshal. He had deputized uh, his brother Wyatt as sort of a, like a second in command, like to step in if he, you know, if Virgil's out of town or something like that. So he's sort of a quasi quasi lawman in this situation. And then in the moment, they had also deputized uh, their brother, uh, Morgan and uh, Doc Holliday as well. So they're kind of acting, acting lawmen in this situation. 
Um, but the uh, event itself actually took place kind of in the back alley of OK Corral. They had walked through the corral, which is a livery. I don't know if people know this, but it's essentially where you like board your horses, you feed, water your horses, get them brushed. And so that's what the OK Corral was. It was just a livery for horses. And the cowboys had actually, trying to get to the next street over, just walked through the OK Corral to go toward uh, Fly's Photography Gallery, which was also a boarding house where Doc Holliday was staying. So the, the idea was that they were walking through the OK Corral to get to where Doc, they knew Doc was and had uh, you know, bought ammunition and had stopped right there kind of behind the OK Corral that's really the only reason why the shootout is affiliated with that location and named after that location, but it actually took place more or less right near the photography gallery. Um, and uh, I actually had some Erpers sending me some photos today from Tombstone making a visit with Flat Research Waverly, um, who you know pointed out uh, some of this. They have like placards and stuff, which is really cool to see that sort of historic interaction that they that Tombstone builds on there. So that's pretty neat. Uh, particularly like highlighting uh, Fly's photography gallery, which is nice. Um, so that's sort of the physical location. Uh, one shooting broke out, you had Ike Clanton hightailing it, I believe through the photography gallery to get out of there because he was unarmed at the time. So he left, I think, pretty quickly after shooting started, um, which is how he escaped um, any harm. Uh, you also had um, Morgan, I believe was shot, or sorry, Virgil was shot in the leg. You had Doc, I think, was shot in the coat. I don't think he was actually harmed. I think you had a similar situation with Wyatt where he was unarmed, but he had some holes in his clothes. Um, and then I think, I think uh, Morgan was uh, just sort of mildly wounded. So they pretty much got through unscathed. Virgil was certainly, you know, got the brunt of it on the, on the ERP side. Um, he actually was interviewed uh, for the trial while he was in the hospital. His testimony was taken from the hospital, um, but he, he, he turned out all right. So that is sort of from before and now a summation of the shootout itself, which again, very brief, very, very brief sort of event that took place. Um, so let's talk about the aftermath when the dust cleared. So, um, like I said, Billy Clanton, Tom McClory, and Frank McClory ended up dead after this event. And again, looking at the ages, it just sort of puts it in perspective. Billy was only 19. Tom and Frank were, or Tom was, you know, 28. Frank was 33 years old. These are pretty young men. Um, you can actually still see their burials uh, on, at Boot Hill Cemetery, um, their headstones, uh, among others like Old Man Clanton. He's also, he also was buried there. Uh, a few other names you might you might find uh, familiar, but you can you can still visit you know and see this this photograph here on the right. You can still see that in person today. Um, their funeral was actually a pretty big event. Uh, you actually had I think 200 or 300 spectators who kind of followed the funeral procession to Boot Hill um, because it was kind of gaining sort of you know attention. It was on all the newspapers, and so people had heard about it. And these are all people, again, these communities are pretty small, so they all would have known names and known, known people who were involved. Um, immediately after the shootout, Ike, unsurprisingly, files charges against Doc and the Earps. Um, you know, three people are dead. He, he feels like they need to be held responsible, lawmen or not. Um, and so uh, charges are immediately filed and they are arrested. I think uh, Doc and Wyatt uh, are held in jail, I believe, for like 16 days um, there at the Tombstone Jail. And like I said, Virgil uh, was um, in the hospital at the time because of his leg wound. So uh, like I said earlier, you can see with the QR code, you can actually read their words. You can read some of the transcripts of the trial, the Spicer hearing, as it's called. Um, the Arizona Memory Project, um, has compiled uh, some documentation too, if you wanna check that out. Um, so that's a really good historic resource um, from the state of Arizona. So there's there's a lot of documentation with this trial. They You can you know exactly who um, uh, testified for the defense, who testified for prosecution. Uh, you had townspeople involved who witnessed it, who testified for both sides. Um, I thought it was interesting that uh, 
you had Sheriff Behan, who actually testified for the prosecution. He mostly took the cowboy side in this. Um, but like we said earlier, you know, last panel, he had a lot of personal and professional hard feelings toward the herbs. So maybe it's not so surprising, um, even if he is sort of the lawman counterpart to Virgil. Um, and it was act it actually came out in the trial that he had like loaned money to Ike, like he had a personal relationship with Ike Clan. So there was a little bit of conflict of interest there. Um, and so, uh, and you also have to think too, um, part of this personal professional conflict, Sheriff Behan was getting a lot of flack at the time for not wrangling in the cowboys and all of their illegal dealings, including like stagecoach robberies and thieving horses and cattle. He was really getting a lot of pressure um, from the territorial governor and other um, uh, law enforcement officials in the state and locals who were just like, can you get a handle on this, please? Like, we're just trying to live our lives and these guys are running amok. Um, and so he, he, he had already kind of caught a lot of flack for this. And so this, the ERPs at the time before the shootout saw this as an opportunity to sort of step in and outshine Sheriff Behan a little bit. You know, if you're not gonna get the job done, we will. Um, which also, you know, increased that tension between the Cowboys and the Earps, and maybe even increased some tensions and, and some of that relation, personal relationship that was already established between Behan and the Cowboys. So um, I just thought it was really interesting that you have a fellow lawman testifying for the Cowboys in this situation and didn't necessarily stick with the law people involved um, in the situation. And we'll see later too that he also wrote a few articles, published a few articles in newspapers, really damning to the Earps. So he took it above and beyond just the trial. Um, it ended up that there were no convictions from this trial. Um, the Judge Spicer basically ruled that Virgil was within his rights as the lawman in this situation to try to disarm the Cowboys, uh, as was the city ordinance. Um, and that he took appropriate action. He did not condone Wyatt's or uh, Doc's uh, or Morgan's roles. Um, he didn't feel like those were appropriate, that they acted appropriately in the situation, but he didn't end up, you know, none of the charges stuck. So it was more like kind of just a slap on the wrist. <clears throat> That's wild. It's yeah. Yeah. Also, it's incredible. I know um, someone asked, um, where you can find the information. I just zoomed back out so y'all can see um, mm -hmm. the QR codes. The one at the bottom um, shows the shooting testimonials. Um, and someone asked, why did uh, Sheriff B train, which is funny, uh, <laughs> not like the herbs just because of the beef with the Clantons? Um, hmm. So in our last panel, we did touch on this a little bit. So you had some personal conflict with Sheriff Behan and particularly Wyatt. Um, one, because um, Sheriff Behan had a mistress, uh, Josephine uh, Sadie Marcus at the time, who uh, was openly with Sheriff Behan. Everyone kind of knew that was his girlfriend. Um, and at some point, records are kind of, you know, shaky on this, but at some point while they're all living in Tombstone, Sadie becomes Wyatt's girlfriend and they continue that relationship for the next 46 years. Um, there is some differing accounts from both Sadie um, and Wyatt on when their relationship started. Um, I don't think, I think, you know, they, as we'll talk about later, they kept their cards close to their chest um, when it comes to their relationship and their history in Tombstone, you know, the parts that weren't public um for good reason but i mean that <laughs> you have to imagine that does not um like that those are some sour grapes that sheriff behan has probably at some point i don't you know this probably this hat their relationship had to start before the okay corral because almost immediately after this there's a few months of a lag but the herps end up leaving arizona altogether um and we'll talk about for reasons why but so at some point probably before the shootout is probably when their relationship really kicks off you also have um, some tension with Behan and the Earps again, because they're kind of stepping in on Sheriff Behan's kind of professional territory here. They're wanting to get elected 
in these positions, they're wanting to kind of make a name for themselves. They're kind of showing him up with the arrests of cowboys and their cowboys associates that Sheriff Behan's not doing. Sheriff Behan has some money to make on the side. You know, he has some personal relationships. So there's bad blood there. Um, you also have uh, early on when the Earps uh, first get to Tombstone, you had kind of a deal, kind of a backdoor deal being made between Sheriff Behan and Wyatt, where Wyatt said, if you run for public office and you're elected sheriff, um, handshake, I'll be your second in command. Uh, and they and they shook on it and that was a deal. And Sheriff Behan ended up reneging on that deal. Um, so that really obviously soured things between the Earps and Sheriff Behan. So there, there was a lot there. You also had, <laughs> this keeps going, you also had the um, Sheriff Behan uh, talking to a very drunk and upset big nose Kate after Doc and Kate had a fight and plying her with more alcohol and working her up even further and having her sign um, uh, uh, an affidavit saying that Doc robbed a stagecoach and immediately took that to Judge Spicer again, same guy and said, here, here it is evidence. She said he did it. And the judge ended up throwing it out, but they, I mean, they used, you know, they used her against him. So there are so many conflicts um, between the sheriff and 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 the Earps and, and Holiday, they're all involved. So good question. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, Gem City Adventures. Do not apologize. This was not a sidetrack. This is just more information that we would love to hear. Um, all about it. Like you said, this whole like the ins and outs, the the drama of Tombstone could be its own show. Yeah. You know? No, I'm telling you, better than The Bachelor, better than The Bachelorette. <laughs> I'm all in. For the OK Corral. Soap opera. Soap opera, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, OK, so on to the next one, the new law. So I found it interesting. Obviously, we talked about this before a little bit. We touched on it. But you have Virgil getting off the hook. You have Wyatt and Doc and, you know, Wyatt's brother getting off the hook. They were, like we said, sort of quasi lawmen, except for Virgil. But they, I mean, the badge basically gave them a pass. They, they killed three people in the street. You could, you could, you know, say which way or the other, of course, if, you know, they're armed, if they were in mortal danger. The result was three people were dead. And these are still really conflicting issues today, obviously. They're, I mean, in this current climate, this is not a new, this is not a new issue. Um, who has the badge has the power. So, and, and not just maybe the badge, but also people in positions of power and authority. There's a system that people are working against. And the Clantons were, and not just the Clantons, the, you know, the McLaurie brothers who passed, um, they're working against a system already. It's an uphill battle if you're involved in a shooting with lawmen. So, and again, you had multiple accounts because the event happened in close quarters for 30 seconds. It was fast, it was quick. You had accounts saying, so-and-so drew first and shot first, so-and-so drew first and shot first. And the, the accounts are so conflicting, there was no resulting uh, conviction. So I think it's very interesting that the writers did such a, a smart thing with the show and ended up putting Sheriff Claiborne and Cleo Clanton in positions of power in purgatory and really flip the script on the Earps in town. You know, you're no longer, you're no longer holding the power. We are. And that was just such a, just such a bl like blowback. You know, as soon as we get back into purgatory, it's like, there's literally a new sheriff in town, like buckle up. Um, and we talked about this too, you know, you made the connection with Doc telling you, Hey, you better go get your guy. You better go, you better go save Ike you know, in the courthouse, he's arrested and you have, you have Billy Clanton and uh, the McLaurie brother, like not depositing their guns, you know, and then that ends up getting them in trouble later. So there's, there are some interesting parallels when Winona gets back into town and she's scrambling to go figure out what's going on. Um, the writers are so smart with this. You know, I don't think any of this is an accident. 100%. I, I mean, I, I firmly believe nothing in Winona Herb is an accident. Yeah, like the writers very much know what they're doing, um, mm -hmm. and like you said, just like flipping the script, it's it's so smart. Mm -hmm. um, because for a while, folks were like, "Are they in a different timeline?" That was like a question right. that people mm -hmm. raised earlier on, um, and it really it feels like they're in an entirely different world. Um, 
where just everything is is out of whack basically um mm -hmm. and like you were saying like the person with the badge has the power and mm -hmm. i think that's been a huge thing they've been talking about in particular these this season how winona is very unsure about what side she's fighting for and if she's fighting for the right side um which again it's just very interesting the way this show kind of examines these really really difficult real world issues um, mm -hmm. well you also had the line i think from last week you know when nicole was having sort of her crisis there in, in shorties and uh doc says something like uh it's not the badge that gives you the authority or the badge is the only thing that gives you the authority or some, something like that yeah. something along those lines which i get what he was saying <laughs> but in situations like this um like the like the shootout um, and like the situation that Winona and Doc and Waverly walk into, you know, 18 months later, sure, you know, they're, they're still, they're still, you know, you're not powerless necessarily, but you're up, you're fighting an uphill battle. I mean, that badge and that gavel gave uh, Holt and Cleo, you know, the upper hand immediately. Um, uh, so, yeah, I, I think, I think it, it is super smart on the part of the writers to, to do this to really see a kind of a sort of kind of an alternate reality really yeah and what's interesting um so i don't mean to like go off track but um uh thank you the badge alone does not give authority um and that's, that's what it. i'm about to yeah. talk about is that doc didn't really have a badge he didn't mm -mm. when mm -mm. all no. of this happened I think, yes i think it's so interesting he Especially in the show, you know, he has this like conflict, you know, with, you know, he's kind of this loner and, and, you know, Wyatt was the law man and he was just like the, the sidekick, you know, he makes reference to himself as the sidekick. Um, but, you know, Doc was not, Doc was still, uh, historically, Doc was associated with, with these guys. He ran with the Earps for years. And in almost every town that they moved to or went to, they were either the sheriff or the constable or the U.S. marshal. You know, one of them was in a position of power. Um, and they all were still, again, just like everyone else, still making a living in other ways, maybe not always in the most legal ways, um, just kind of scraping by, um, uh, you know, making their money where they can. But yeah, Doc, Doc in this situation was sort of deputized in the moment just to, just to assist, just to help. Um, but it didn't matter. I mean, as soon as that sort of, you know, power was handed over, like he was within his right to stand shoulder to shoulder with Virgil and address these guys and try to disarm them and end up getting away with killing potentially two cowboys. He probably killed uh, Billy Clanton um, and he may have gotten a shot at one of the McLaurie brothers. So he, he potentially killed two people and didn't necessarily, Doc Holliday didn't necessarily have to be there that day in, in that alley. You know, he, he chose to walk up with them and help them in the situation. Virgil, that was his job. You know, he went to go disarm them because they were breaking a city ordinance. He felt like in his testimony, he felt like he was in danger. He felt like some, one of them, you know, drew first. And so he had to act so on and so forth. These are very, you know, there's a lot of gray area here. Um, but Doc didn't have to be there. That was not part of his job description. So it's very interesting. His stance now. Yep, it's, it's, uh, it's just so, God, I love this show. Um, all right, where okay. to next? Okay, so let's go to the Clanton Vendetta. Uh, so folks may have heard of the Earp Vendetta or the Earp Vendetta Ride or something like that. It has a, it has a, its own folklore name. You can Wikipedia it, it has its own page. But really, there is a Clanton vendetta, uh, and it, it starts almost immediately. Revenge, Ike wants to take revenge as soon as he doesn't get the results that he wants. Um, and as we know, he doesn't have any scruples with, you know, illegal activity or doing things his own way. And he has a lot of connections in the area. The Cowboys, the Cowboys, quote unquote, gang sort of crime syndicate. Again, not to give them too much like credit, but it was a pretty widespread sort of organization because you had a lot of young men in the area who were looking for opportunity in this, in Arizona territory and stealing cattle or uh, donkeys, which they actually stole some donkeys like from the US Army nearby. 
Um, that was a whole thing that the Arabs were involved in and taking, taking um, some of the cowboy associates, um, uh, arresting them almost as soon as they got there in Arizona. But this is something that, that you know, there's a lot of associates associated either you know with the cowboy group or affiliated with them has worked with them before and so on which is another reason why Wyatt had approached Ike you know with that reward money that we talked about last panel um, because he knew Ike would know where to find these guys and you know said if you find them and kill them or find them and bring them in I'll give you the reward money and Ike didn't have you know any scruples going and doing that which didn't end up working out for him but um, so Ike didn't feel like justice was served um, he actually, you know, him and his associates decided to take actions into their own hands. You actually have two assassination attempts. Um, one of them was successful. So you had, um, excuse me, you had Virgil two months, two months after the OK Corral shootout. He's got a limp. He's still not completely healed from uh, his gunshot wound. Um, I believe he was walking in town at night and uh, someone kind of jumped out and took a couple shots at him um, and ran off. I believe that was a circumstance. He was alone at the time, um, but Ike was, or sorry, Virgil was shot in the arm and actually incapacitated his arm for the rest of his life. It, he never really regained full function of that arm. Um, and this was just, you know, two months later. And at that site, they found a hat, which was apparently identifiable as Ike Clanton's hat. Um, so the authorities, you know, went to, um, you know, obviously Ike is not the authority in this situation, or sorry, Virgil is not the authority going in this situation, but they approach Ike Clanton and say, you know, where were you and is this yours? And of course he has associates who vouch for him and say, oh no, he was here. He was here all morning. Like we know where he's at. It's not him. And there just wasn't enough evidence to say that it was Ike Clanton who, who shot Virgil. So the charges that they that the Earps had brought against him were dismissed. Um, but then you have another assassination attempt. I believe this was um, five months after the OK Corral shootout. You had Morgan Earp uh, playing cards uh, in a saloon. I think Wyatt was also present at the time and maybe Doc, but I'm pretty sure Wyatt was also present. And you had a shot through a, a, a window and a door um, of, the, of the back door of the saloon which ended up hitting Morgan and he ended up dying. Um, again, uh, you know, Wyatt and the Earps are like, it's them, it's, it's Ike. If it's not Ike, it's like one of his buddies, like, come on, this is no accident. Um, so two days later after Morgan is assassinated, Virgil's still wounded and the, uh, you know, Wyatt and, and Virgil decide, we just need to get, you, we need to get you out of here. You know, you were vulnerable. We just had a brother killed. The Earps had family actually living in California. So they decided to, um, you know, put Morgan's body on a train and, and put Virgil and his wife on a train and get them, get them out of Tombstone. So, but they escorted him to the train station because, I mean, they, they know something's going to happen, right? So you had Wyatt and Doc and some other associates, you know, escorting Virgil and Morgan's body to the train station. And before they ever get to boarding the train, you had Frank Stillwell, who was a cowboy associate, jump out and like try to try to uh, fire a few shots at Virgil and, and, and the other the other herbs there. And you had Wyatt and a couple of others chase him down. And for years, it was actually speculated who actually killed Frank. Um, there are some reports that um, it was Wyatt who fired the shot that shot Frank in the back. Um, Cause again, Frank was like kind of an oh shit situation and took off running after his uh, shots weren't successful and he was shot in the back. Um, don't know for sure if that's accurate that Wyatt was really the one that ended up shooting him or if it was someone else. But like I said, there's some account that, that you know, Wyatt said he did it. But these later accounts as we'll talk about from Wyatt and others are kind of suspect a little bit. Um, regardless, the result is that Frank died. So they put Virgil and Morgan's body on a train, some in California to get out of there. And almost immediately, Doc and Wyatt turn around, go back to Tombstone and start rallying people up. And they're like, this is it. We're going, we're not going to be on the defense anymore. We're going on the offense. Um, we're going after Ike and we're going after his buddies and we're not going to take this anymore. Um, 
So uh, this is where the Erp Vendetta ride, the famous Erp Vendetta ride basically starts. But I just think it's interesting that you, if, if you look this up, um, like I said, you got like capital letters, proper noun, Erp Vendetta ride is a thing, but like not the Clanton Vendetta. Like even though they killed one of the Erps, like they killed Morgan, they, sh they wounded Virgil, you know, like the Clanton sought justice just as the Erps, you know, now think they're seeking justice too. Um, it's a tit for tat. I mean, that's the whole thing leading up to this is a big tit for tat game. Um, but it's just, you know, the ante is up every time because now we're having people actually die. Um, so uh, this is actually a photo of the train station. I believe it's near Tucson. I could be wrong, but this is the train station uh, where Frank Stilwell uh, fired at the Europe's and fired at, um, at Virgil. Um, and there you see too um, a photo of Morgan Earp um, on the bottom left. Uh, a lot of his photos when I was looking at them actually like look a lot like Wyatt. Um, I think they're the closest in age too. They look very similar. Um, I also think that they're, I could be wrong, someone in Arizona, tell me if I'm wrong or go take flat research Waverly. But I think there is a bronze statue of Doc Holliday and Wyatt Earp at the Tucson train station, like life-sized. Tell me, someone someone check that out for me. It's a pandemic, I can't travel. Come on, Earp, um, get on it, get on it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so Clanton curse. So like I like we kind of talked about last panel, like I just talked about with this this Clanton Vendetta, it's you know, I I slipped up a couple times last panel calling it a Clanton curse because I think that's kind of what it is. I mean, you have Ma'am Clanton who has these magical powers. I think she's called the Swamp Witch, which is very interesting considering we're in the Arizona desert, um, sort of originating with this family. Nothing swampy about it. Um, I mean, I guess you couldn't have Nicole throw up frogs if it, she wasn't the Swamp Witch, like maybe like horny toads or something if, if she was like the Desert Witch, I don't know. Um, but I think it's, but I think, I think it's, I think it's just as much of a curse in many ways that, that the Earps have um, put on them, you know, this responsibility that they have, this sort of like tension and a kind of an obsession almost that ends up, you know, ruining a lot of the herbs before we get to Winona. And even we know now that the responsibility that Winona has is taking its toll on her, as we saw last night. But why not, why couldn't obsession with revenge or obsession with uh, your brand of vigilante justice or, you know, anger, this obsessive anger, why couldn't that be, I think, kind of a curse within itself? because I think that's what the Clantons have been dealing with this whole time, is this obsession to get back at Doc Holliday, to get back at the Earps, um, kind of manifested in the Reapers, really. Yeah. Wow. I need to sit on that for a bit. <laughs> I'm just saying, I'm just saying. Because um, you do have, you know, man who like really revels in this you know, this gives her life purpose, you know, she took it, she was giddy, you know, with the prospect of like using Nicole, like using Doc Holliday, or, you know, using them to get to Doc, you know, this is her chance, this is what her ancestors wanted. And then you have Cleo, who, you know, is just this, at the time, you know, just reluctant, like, I, just, you know, I don't want any part of this, this is just sort of ruining things for me, but this is how she's raised, this is all she knows. Um, and the, like, Earp, Clanton gang up last night, like, like tag teaming the situation. Like I did not have that on my bingo card. No, I, there were quite a few things that happened last night that <laughs> I did not have on my bingo card. Um, Fair. Heads up, I think we might start referring to things about episode 410. So if you have not seen it yet, be careful. You've been warned. Um, Weird. You've been warned. Um, Yeah, it's, I guess, I don't even know what to say, because it's, 
I have to question. I one. I will get out a thought. I promise. Like I will form a coherent thought. Um, it's 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 interesting to me that like within all of this, right? And then in the show we have Doc who's trying to resolve it, who's trying to like end it, um, which at times I've found to be very hypocritical of him considering just like his past but now mm -hmm. I'm biting my words a little bit and kind of taking into consideration like the things he's been through mm -hmm. um, like you're saying right now how like he lost a bunch of people in his life and then in the show like of course he was like stuck in a well um, but it makes sense that he's using this energy to kind of resolve things as opposed to um, perpetuating just, this. Yeah, just keeping just keeping it perpetuated. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it does make sense. He, he's he's old. He's over it. You know, at this point, he came out of the well ready for revenge against, um, you know, um, against Cludy. Um, you know, ready to to kill her and seek revenge on her. But when it comes to the Clantons, like, I think he, I mean, he's always just kind of seemed over it from the beginning. He, like, he just, he always wanted to kind of take a step back from it. Um, so I just, I just think it's interesting to, like I said, like this, I think it's a Clanton curse. There's magic involved. Um, so it's maybe not as straightforward, you know, as the Earp curse is. But I think, I think obsession, revenge, and anger is its own sort of curse. It eats away, it's eaten away at this family. It's destroyed their family dynamic. Um, and, um, you know, Cleo now really has a lot of choices to make, um, how she's going to handle this, um, which I'm really excited. And I, I saw, I think in, in one of, um, Emily's interviews, she kind of makes a mention of that, like, you know, Cleo's, Cleo's going to make some moves, you know? And so be on the lookout for that. Cause there are a lot of parallels between Cleo and Winona and the situation that they find themselves in. So I think we're going to, I hope we see a little bit more of that. Yeah. I feel like Cleo is Winona, like when my when the show started yeah yeah um, she's kind of flip side yeah yeah and i think cleo might take a different path than winona did um i would think so too if nothing else just for the fact that it seems like cleo could actually walk away better than winona can walk away right um she's not trapped by the magical gun um, she doesn't have necessarily the family structure to continually keep saving and protecting and this responsibility. Her family, you know, I, they made a reference like, oh, your family's always with you. And she's like, unfortunately. Um, but she's, she's referring to the Reapers and the legacy, not necessarily a curse that she can't shake. Um, you know, she obviously still has the powers, you know, the witchy powers, but she has, she has a choice. She has uh, options to decide how she wants to use that power. Um, and for good or worse or otherwise, or for her own benefit or for other people's benefit. So I hope she makes some, some good decisions for herself <laughs> in, in the coming episodes. Yeah. And I um, hope that Wynonna is able to see like that humanity side of her. Yeah. And I think she already has. I think Wynonna is starting to see it. Um, yeah. she's just, Cleo is such a wonderful character and, mm -hmm. um, the actress's name Savannah, if I'm not mistaken is absolutely killing it killing it um yeah yeah but uh, and and again just basically reiterating what you were saying but i feel like the way that they're handling the clan curse in the show it almost talks about like inherited mental illness from family members um in a very like you know what I'm saying, but um, how in a way that Winona or the show does right yeah. exactly um, yeah. where you can get passed down these these certain um, things to you like like you can you can inherit like depression you can inherit anxiety like that that could be passed down to you but then it's like it's like your choice what to do from there. Mm -hmm. um, no, that's good. Which is like the revenge and the anger, like that's just passed on. That's just familial, and then it's their yeah. choice. Like, yeah, I'm these gonna... are not things that Cleo experienced herself. These are things that her ancestors experienced, 
And while it still affects their family to this day, um, in many ways that it, that is outside of their control, their legacy, their reputation and so on, you know, it's their choice that they want to seek revenge and, and not reconciliation or, you know, finding common ground. Um, like, you know, Doc has kind of decided to do, um, to extend, extend a hand, um, and, and Holt wanted to kind of do too, um, before ma'am died. Um, but he was even still considering it, you know, Doc said, oh, well, come talk with me. Let's go this way when my Nona shot him in the back. So, um, I know we're running out of time. We're going short or we're going a little long again. So let's jump to the Earth Vendetta real quick. Um, so like I said, the Earp Vendetta is like the more famous one. It's like a federal posse is get, has that name again because of these deputizations that happened that, you know, Wyatt said, I need you, I need you, I need you. Come help me. Let's go do this. Let's 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 seek justice. Um, let's like nip this in the bud. So after the arrest of Frank Stillwell, you had or sorry, after the killing of Frank Stillwell, you had an immediate arrest warrant put out for Earp and Holiday. Um, for killing him, and that's Sheriff Behan again setting out these arrest warrants um, because they shot Frank in the back. Um, so you have uh, the Earp Vendetta immediately setting out over much of Cochise County searching for the Cowboys and their associates, and you also have Sheriff Behan's uh, posse riding out hot on their heels, following them all throughout the area, never really catching up with them, but basically like one step behind trying to catch them. Um, so between March and April of 1882, you have the Earp Federal Posse searching most of the county for, for the associates, Behan hot on their tail. Um, also involved in Behan's group is Finn Clanton, who is the oldest brother of the Clanton family, who I mentioned before in the last panel, didn't seem to be quite as involved in their criminal activity. Um, but with this one, he's got, um, you know, his little brother Billy was killed, so he's, he probably has a little more skin in the game at this point and wants to bring the herbs to justice. Um, and so Finn Clanton is riding alongside Behan. Um, I found this uh, grave marker on the left of Finn's, uh, Finn's uh, headstone. And I just thought it was very interesting that his family, um, cause again, it's kind of, it's hard to remember the Clantons and the herbs, they're real people. They have real descendants, they're alive today. And his family decided to put this marker on his headstone which um, says not all good men wore badges. Um, this is something he wanted people forever to take away. Um, you know, with that Clanton name, he wanted people to know. And that really kind of struck me. Um, and so uh, back to the, back to the Yurt Vendetta, you have the Yurt Posse killing four additional cowboys in sort of shootout situations. Um, none of them were directly involved at the OK Corral shootout, but they are cowboys who if you research this a little further we'll see that they had dealings with the herbs before running into them being arrested so on so they're they were folks familiar to them um they knew they knew uh what side of the law they fell on and or return i think all of them returned fire you know this was these were all like i said all shootout situations and the herbs ended up winning um and immediately after doing this is when the herbs and doc fled arizona for new mexico because of the arrest warrants um, and I think they also, you know, Doc ended up going to Colorado. Um, uh, Wyatt ended up living in a, a number of states um, after, in those years later, ended up settling in California. Um, but I believe Doc and Wyatt parted ways in Albuquerque not too soon after leaving Arizona. Um, but this whole thing, the Earth Posse ride, there's artwork. There's statues. This is another one of those like folkloric things um, that has come out of this event, um, which gets more, I don't know, romanticized than like this Clanton vendetta, which again, ended up, you know, wounding Virgil and killing Morgan. So I, I just think it's interesting, um, the, the uh, comparison, which again goes to our next slide, which is shaping the legacy which is this whole discussion, the whole reason why we've been watching a show called Winona Earp, why, why anyone knows why its name is all because of this shaping of a narrative and, and how, we were, how we've been able to romanticize the Wild West and why anyone cares to go to Tombstone, Arizona out in the middle of nowhere um, is because of this. So 
I thought it was interesting that initially, immediately following the shootout, you kind of have a, a sentimentality for the Cowboys. You have newspaper articles um, kind of taking the Cowboys side in the situation, kind of condemning how the Arabs handled the situation, which I thought was interesting because that seemed to be the prevailing sentiment at the time immediately following it. Um, and like I said before, Behan published an article damning to the Arabs. Um, you had, uh, and I think Wyatt and Sadie Marcus ended up publishing or making a few statements in the newspaper contradicting Behan's account uh, directly. So you had a lot of newspaper fighting, uh, publishing back and forth week to week, uh, uh, which is, isn't a surprise considering apparently death threats were also published before the OK Corral shootout. Like, Ike and the Cowboys would make public death threats and publish them in the newspaper and the newspaper would actually do it. So it's very interesting how these fights, like it's the, it's their social media, right? They're making these public declarations against each other. What really changes the tide is in the 1920s and early 1930s, you get a couple of books published that start the romantic, romanticization of the Earps and Holiday role in the OK Corral shootout, particularly Wyatt's role, which again, he was not the major player really. Virgil is. Virgil's the real lawman. Virgil's the one wounded in the fight, ends up surviving, you know, all this kind of thing. I mean, he easily could have been, you know, the more heroic figure historically in, in these publications, but it's not, and it's Wyatt. And I think it's mo mostly because Wyatt lives longer than his brothers. So he has the opportunity to continue shaping the narrative or people continuing to say, hey, you were there, can I interview you? Um, he's there, he's present. And, and Clanton's art, Ike dies, I think six or seven years after the OK Corral shootout and some other sort of nefarious thing that he was doing. Um, you know, Finn, Finn, you saw when he died, but you know, he wasn't really, you know, wanting to make a lot of statements or kick up a lot of fuss about this, be in the public eye. Wyatt and Sadie were not necessarily the same. They didn't want to be in the public eye all the time. They were bugged for interviews constantly, but they would give little bits and pieces. They would, they would feed these authors and these screenwriters a little bit here and there about their life. And then they would take those nuggets and sort of expand on them and make them what they wanted to be. And I think you also have this sort of confluence of these, these books being published around the same time that the movie industry is starting to take off. So you have these books being published that is like hero status, you know, the good guys and the bad guys, the black cowboy hats and the white cowboy hats. You know, this, I mean, one of them is called Tombstone, an Iliad of the Southwest. I mean, how much more like hero worshiping can you get than that title, which, you know, creates this persona. But you have these books being published that are blowing things up above and beyond, a mixture of fact and fiction. And then you have them being turned into screenplays and you have them being turned into movies. And so you have these authors who are going to, you know, the movie sets and you've got Wyatt coming to some of the movie sets because he's also living around Hollywood at that time. He's making friends with the screenwriters and the actors. So it's, I don't think if this event would have happened a little sooner or a little later, or you didn't have some of these authors writing books when they did, you wouldn't have had the, the movie industry continuing to romanticize and create this image around the event and around Wyatt specifically that we do today. Um, and I thought it was interesting that you had, uh, you had a photo of a poster of uh, Tom Mix poster, who was a famous cowboy actor um, in the early 20s and 30s, hanging in the uh, Ghost River Triangle Museum when they had, uh, you know, old Wyatt being interviewed there um, with Doc and Winona. There's a Tom Mix poster on the wall, which I don't, it was no accident. Tom Mix was one of uh, Wyatt's friends. He was actually at his funeral. Um, they were buddies. Um, I think that was a nice little nod um, that the set directors or, or the writers did. Um, and so also you have, like I said, at the same time, after Wyatt dies, you have Josephine living for a number of years afterwards, people bugging her for interviews and information. One of the facts that I thought was very interesting was in season one, Doc said something like, Wyatt was a teetotaler. He preferred ice cream over a drink which is a false fact that Josephine actually perpetuated because at the time of the interviews when they were happening in the 20s, uh, teetotaling and uh, prohibition was popular. So she wanted to help Wyatt's image. And so she told them he wasn't a drinker, um, which is just false, like he was. He owned a number of saloons and liked to drink. 
<laughs> it's one of the myths that persisted. I just, like, not to bring Hamilton into this, but, like, to bring <laughs> Hamilton into this, like, who lives, who dies, who tells your story. Um, oh, my Lord. Right. So that's why we really have this good guy, bad guy thing, Wyatt is a hero, the romanticization of him as an individual, as a person, even though he was a very, you know, um, complicated person. You know, he, like we've said before, over and over, he was not a saint, you know, he's done, he, 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 he was, he had charges brought against him before he made it to Arizona for horse theft. And, and he, there's rumors that he actually like was a pimp in, in um, Dodge um, in Kansas. So, I mean, you know, he, he, he was a jack of all trades. He made money where he could, um, and it wasn't always lawful. So we, this idea that he was this stand-up lawman is just not correct. We see that being challenged in Winona a little bit, um, you know, what kind of stories he's telling and the narrative shaping that was happening in that interview at the museum where Doc was like, this is my friend. What is he saying? You know, like maybe he's not the guy who I thought he was. Um, and it's really because he lives long enough. Him and Sadie live long enough to tell the tale. They, these authors are giving them a platform. And then the movie business is really just taking that to the masses um, and continuing to perpetuate this and making the Clantons bad guys, like not the gray conflicted figures. They probably are too, but just straight up bad guys. So then we end up taking sides. And, and they just like, um, I don't believe that the clip of Wyatt from the museum is real. Um, I believe that's, that's an actor. Um, oh yeah. From the show. Yes. Yeah. That's yeah. No, that's not the real Wyatt or being interviewed. No. Yeah. Um, good question though. Um, yeah. they really just like took control of the narrative is what happened. Yeah. They like found yeah. an opportunity and, and they were just like, well, no one else is doing anything cause they're all dead so who can yeah. even um like who can even say that they're wrong you know exactly um, which is why when it comes to who shot frank Stillwell, who drew first you know these are all questions authors are asking too because why it's the only one left still alive who was there and it's not that he threw everyone under the bus like in that scene um but there he, he got to pick and choose what he talked about how he framed it um you know he got to shape that narrative and sadie like i said really did uh, Wyatt, I think, was interviewed uh, just a handful of times by Stuart Lake before he published um, uh, his Frontier Marshall book. Um, but Sadie really, really was a, kind of obsessed with shaping uh, Wyatt's image after he died um, and was very secretive, even with Wyatt's uh, family, um, again, about like their relationship she didn't want any mention of his first wife in any of the biographies. He was married when he was in Missouri and his wife ended up dying in childbirth. She didn't want her name in there. So she was all about scrubbing and cleaning and you know, really shaping and molding what she wanted people to know. Um, and I mean, she holds the power. Yeah. So did Wyatt. Yeah, and this is all just, it's so interesting and, and like, First of all, like, thank you for coming on to like talk about it, and because I knew nothing about any of this. <laughs> um, unfortunately, there's no like um, Winona Earp section in like history classes, um, <laughs> though I wish there was. Um, you know, in some college, like that's an opportunity for like Winona Earp Western Fiction 101. Like that's totally a class someone could do. Someone has to, someone jump on that. You're, yeah. you're about to make millions. Um, <laughs> it's, it's just so interesting to like learn about it and then realize that the writers on this show did like the same exact research mm -hmm. before writing it. But like sometimes writers, they don't necessarily look at facts before they write things they they take a lot of liberties um but something that this show does so well is that it's like no we're not going to take liberties we want to make sure that we get this right mm. um well i'm playing with general themes even if it's not explicitly 
you know, the same as like this happened in history exactly like this. It's still taking those themes that we just talked about, you know, revenge and, 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 and you know, curses and like, what does that mean? And, and how do you handle it? And what's a legacy? Who gets to shape that legacy? Who gets to tell that story? You know, it may not be word for word what we just talked about, you know, may not mention exact references to these books or these movies, you know, that actually exist that ended up shaping how we think about Wyatt and the OK Corral, but they're taking those same themes and they're putting it in Winona Earp and they're, they're, they're making it more real, more visceral for us to experience because these are universal type of things. And these are things in general in history we should all be thinking about. If you're reading a history book, a biography, um, you're in history class and you're learning about an event or whatever, think about who has the power. Think about who gets to write that history. And it's usually the victors. Um, who, and why are they writing it the way that they are? Um, for example, uh, I know there's lots of folks who aren't from the United States who are listening to this panel, but things like the Revolutionary War or the Civil War, why is it that we only have accounts from white landed gentry? You know, why is it that we only have men's accounts of their experience during these things? Um, you know, women were, <laughs> women were experiencing the same things. People of color were experiencing the same things. So really, really think about when you're, when you're looking, when you're investigating history, when you're learning about a historic event, which we all, you know, that's shaping, it shapes our world today and it still does, really kind of consider who wrote this and why. When you're visiting a museum and you're looking at um, an, a, uh, an exhibit or you're reading a plaque, and it says this, that, and the other, or this is displayed and this isn't displayed, really kind of investigate and kind of ask yourself, why is this here and these other things aren't? Or what is the purpose and what, I'm gonna, what am I learning out of this? Or what am I not learning out of this? And what's the gap that's not being filled? And then do some research on your own. It exists out there. Um, there are books about women's accounts of the Civil War uh, and things like that, or you know, other, other, other historic events that you're interested in. Um, there are accounts of, uh, you know, uh, Big Nose Kate was present, uh, apparently watching from the window during the OK Corral. What did she see? What was her perspective? Um, we talked about Sadie Marcus, how there were rumors about her being a prostitute, um, and maybe she was. But at the same time, she was also an independent, unmarried woman. So maybe they just assumed things about her. So these are good, good questions to sort of consider. Who has the power when writing these stories? Who gets to shape the narrative? I could not have said it better myself. Um, so as we're wrapping up here, um, first of all, thank you so much, once again. Um, incredibly informative, along with just being so interesting. Um, and it's, it's kind of what you said at the end, like, this isn't just all about a TV show, like take into consideration when you're learning about history, like mm -hmm. who has the pen, you know? Mm -hmm. um, yep. Like really think about it. And these are just lessons that we've learned from this demon hunting show that has chicken kickers and goo, you know? I'm, I'm telling you, like um, this is a, a demon hunter show with chicken kickers and goo and dick jokes and will sneak under your skin and rip out your heart and say, thank you, may I have some more, please? I mean, that is that is the show that Wine on Earth is. And uh, I don't know why networks aren't fighting over it because we can go on and on and on for endless panels talking about these things. Um, and I'm just, I'm glad that I have this platform on Twitter, Instagram, doing panels like this with uh, to to talk about history, how history interacts with with our current, you know, our favorite show, but in media and um, how folks can like interact with history and think about history differently. So thanks. Thanks you guys for having me. I appreciate it. Um, thank you. Um, speaking of wanting to laugh and then tear your heart out, um, stay tuned at 4 p.m. We have our reactors panel. Uh, it'll be myself, Adam, and Haley. Um, you are not gonna wanna mix it. We are gonna be talking about episode 410 where I, not a lot happened, right? No, nothing. No, I mean, yeah. I think you don't need to watch it. It's fine. It's it wasn't no. basically it was a cotton, just, candy. cotton candy episode. Yeah, basically just like running around through the field, um, frolicking. Um, <laughs> at any rate, um, thank you again. Um, everyone is showering you with praise and thanks and and thanking you for 
your passion um, for all of this, and I want to echo that as well. Um, yeah, thank you guys so much. Yeah, so let's um, we'll wrap this up, and I will see you all at 4 p.m. Thanks. <laughs>